All right, hello, and welcome to Fireside Chat, the perception of risk. My name is Suzanne Van Arsdale, and I'm a postdoctoral research fellow at the Legal Priorities Project. Uh, there, I conduct legal research on governance of emerging biotechnology and approaches to bio risk. And I'm excited to introduce you to Paul Brest, who is a former dean and active professor emeritus at Stanford Law School. He's a co-author of Money Well Spent, a Strategic Guide to Smart Philanthropy, a co-author of Problem Solving, Decision Making, and Professional Judgment, and he's written numerous articles on constitutional law, philanthropy, and impact investing. His current courses include Problem Solving for Public Policy and Social Change and Systems Thinking. Today, Paul will be discussing two topics. First, how to think rationally about and act on risks of harm. And second, subjective determinants of perceived risks. So, as in previous sessions, we invite you to use the live discussion board to talk and share resources during the session. And please use the questions tab to share any questions you have and upvote any questions you would like answered. And so the format of this session will be two short presentations with a brief Q&A after each. So make sure you share your questions as you think of them so we can get to them after each part. Um, Paul will also be around after this session on Gather Town to continue the Q&A. And so without further ado, please welcome Paul Brest. Well, thank you. And thanks, Suzanne, and welcome everybody else. Uh, let me share my screen briefly. Oh, we have already. As Suzanne mentioned, we're going to divide our 25 minutes into two parts. One is how to think rationally about and act on risks of harm. And let me just start there. Um, and I'm going to use mainly existential risks as my examples. So when you're pretty certain what the benefit is, uh, for example, protecting a city against sea level rise, the fundamental way of thinking about it is benefit minus cost. That is, what's the benefit uh, that you're going to get, uh, in this case measured perhaps in lives and property, and what's the cost? And if the benefit exceeds the cost, then it's a go on that. What happens when you're thinking about probabilistic benefits? Uh, for example, you're advocating, as we did when I was at the Hewlett Foundation, uh, supporting organizations advocating for a carbon tax, where the results are anything but certain. In that case, uh, you discount the benefit by the likelihood of success. Uh, it could be, I think, in, in the case of that advocacy work, that you might estimate there's a 10% chance of succeeding. So no matter how great the benefit is, uh, ex ante, you really can only expect 10%. Sure expect 10% of that. What about when the likelihood of benefits is simply uncertain or unknown? Uh, uncertainty is a concept that the economist Frank Knight brought into to the conversation. Risk means you know what it is. Uncertain means you just don't know what it is. You can't use the expected return approach because that requires knowing what the likelihood of success is. Uh, and a, a you know, many catastrophic risks or existential risks fit that. Uh, what's the likelihood of a meteor hitting or anything you do uh, to mitigating, uh, preventing a meteor from hitting? In the lower left-hand corner, I have an example. Richard Posner, the, the judge, was very concerned that uh, super colliders would create a black hole that would envelop the universe. Uh, a low probability, perhaps almost zero probability, but definitely a catastrophic or existential risk. Uh, we really don't have a way of, uh, of dealing with that. Let me end this first part with, with a famous uh, story by Blaise Pascal, the 17th century philosopher, who asked the question, should I believe in God? And his answer was yes, even though he thought there was a small likelihood of God existing, because if you don't believe in God and God exists, you are doomed to uh, an eternity, a miserable eternity. So this is an example where what he thought was a low probability existential risk to, to himself uh, was worth, ta worth taking the action of believing in God. So I'm going, to, I'm going to stop there and turn it back to Suzanne and hopefully some questions from you all. 
Yeah, thank you, Paul, for sharing that. Um, one question I have is what approaches do exist or how are people trying to make decisions under uncertainty now? I think, I think the best one can do is probably rank order some of the uncertainties. I mean, even that requires a degree of certainty in order to do. But you might say, for example, as almost all scientists have said, that the likelihood of a super collider creating a black hole is, is infinitesimal, whereas we know that climate change uh, is a very high probability. You can rank things in between. Um, and you also have to rank order the possibility of doing anything about it. You know, in the case of the super collider, you could just stop those experiments uh, in the case of, of a meteor, uh, you would have to devote considerable resources to try to track and prevent a meteor from hitting the Earth. In the case of climate, we know exactly what to do. And while the costs are high, uh, the costs are, are you know, pretty predictable. Right. And so um, what do you think are the challenges of using that approach? And do other organizations use uh, other ways? I think, I think when you're dealing with existential risks, uh, and I'll come back in, in, the, in the second part of our conversation, I'll come back to subjective risk perception <laughs> and what the way organizations actually works. But I'm, I'm not sure there that you can do better than kind of a rank ordering and then say, you know, what is it we are capable of doing? Uh, so you, you, you mentioned, Suzanne, your own organization, some of the things you're working on, like biological uh, hazards, are risks which we, we at least know how to deal with. Uh, and one possibility, mm -hmm. you know, there's the old, the old adage that to a person with a hammer, every problem looks like a nail. Well, this is a case where right. maybe right. It may be that if you have a hammer, you can use it on those problems that look like, like nails. <laughs> Right. Is that also an argument to, you know, have more perspectives and uh, diversity as you're considering these different risks and doing this kind of ranked order? Uh, perspective and diversity in what respects? Um, yeah, uh, perhaps in, um, you know, in technical backgrounds or, you know, I don't know if there are areas where you think it would be most meaningful to have different perspectives. I mean, it, call, it calls for making your, your best bets about both the risk and ways of dealing with it. And I think those both call for uh, a fair amount of technological expertise. And uh, in the case of how you're gonna deal with it, probably political and, and social expertise as well. You know, huge, almost all ways of dealing with these risks comes down, come down to policies and that means that you have to kind of be pretty good at designing policies and then figuring out how you can get appropriate policy organizations like a legislature to adopt them. Yeah, thank if, you. If you and think about it, yeah, go ahead. Oh no, please. I was gonna say, you know, coming back to, coming back to climate, uh, you know, there, there have been, there was an attempt going back to the Copenhagen round of negotiations uh, by foundations that were concerned about the existential risk of, of global warming to put together an agreement among countries in Copenhagen. And they, they, they used their expertise, but it wasn't enough uh, to do that. So the expertise mm -hmm. for doing that is quite different from the expertise of, of trying to prevent a meteor from hitting the earth. Right, of course. And I wanna make sure we get to one or two of these audience questions. Um, the top one right now, uh, Jonathan Weiner and John Graham in 1995 wrote about risk-risk trade-offs, which involve not just a cost-benefit analysis for one risk, but two, and how those might interact. And so how might the perceptions of risk-risk trade-offs differ from comparing each risk independently? So I'm, I'm not, I don't know uh, that literature in particular. But one way of thinking about it, and I'm not sure what the question has in mind, is if you just think about the resources the a government has or the resources the world has, 
it can't deal with all of those. That's why you, I think you have to rank order them some. Mm -hmm. uh, you have to, you have to choose some things. What to deal yeah. with? Yeah, yeah. Thank you. And then. Um, another person asks, isn't it the case that some probabilities, which initially seem impossible to evaluate, can, with extra effort and innovation, be estimated after all? Uh, for example, the probability of a devastating meteor impact. You know, I, th I, think, the, I think that it's a useful exercise to gain information to see if you can be clear about what the probability is. And that may be a place where, where you can what you can do at least is narrow the the range of probabilities, kind of the the margin of error, and right. that may that may then help you uh, assess whether that's a risk you can deal with or not. Yeah, and then um, I just want to make sure we have time. Uh, would you like to? Or do you have any other thoughts on this, or should we move on to the next set of slides? Uh, let's move on. If we if if there's if there's more discussion after this, we can do it in the in whatever room follows this event. Absolutely. So let me sh let me share my slides again briefly. So I want to talk. We've, we've been talking about how you can think rationally about risk, and I now want to turn to how how people actually think about risk, which often deviates from rationality. Uh, and three three points. One is uh, people are unable to understand probabilities very well. Another is one's assessment, one's sense that something is risky is culturally determined to a large extent. And then finally, the availability heuristic. So this is this is a set of experiments, but this this particular experiment on, on the screen gets at it. People were asked uh, whether they could, you know, what action they would take, uh, in effect, how much they would pay to avoid the risks of a release of toxic gases where the chances were one in 100,000, one in a million, and one in 10 million. Uh, when you have those low probabilities, people just can't distinguish among them. Uh, and so they were, willing, they were willing to take the same action for all of them. And that leads to a phenomenon that I think Cass Sunstein called probability neglect. When the probability is very low, people think there's no risk at all. And when the probability is very high, they think it's not risky at all, it's just certain to happen. So that's one issue. Another, and this is work that comes out of Dan Kahan's uh, lab at Yale, uh, and, it, and it antecedes the, the current mask and, vi and, and vaccine issues. He looked to, he, he learned that people's perception of risk has a lot to do with where they fall on a scale where from left to right is individualism or communitarianism and vertically from hierarchy to egalitarianism. So people who are hierarchical individualists uh, aren't, uh, you know, they're not worried about uh, environmental issues. Uh, they're not worried about nuclear warfare. Uh, they're really concerned about people taking their guns away. And if you look at the, the lower right-hand column, uh, people who are in the egalitarian, communitarian uh, domain have very different risks. And you can see that playing out to some extent. You know, the, the, the politicization of, of responses to COVID go beyond this, but I think you can see these cultural worldviews playing a role. So that's the second point. And then finally, this, you know, the availability heuristic is one of the, the many contributions that, that Danny Kahneman and Amos Fersky made to psychology. And it's that people's perception of risk is very much determined by how, how vivid and available to mind the risks are. So here's a very recent example, right? We all saw that J&J's vaccines were paused because there were, I think, six uh, incidents of clotting. And so roughly the percent, the, the likelihood of somebody getting the vaccine of getting a clot, clot, if you look at the very bottom of the screen, is really an infinitesimal, but it's it's a calculable, uh, calculable uh, probability. And then you compare it to other things. Let's you know the annual risk of being killed in a motor vehicle crash is about one in five thousand. 
So you're much more likely to be killed driving your car than you are to be killed getting, getting the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. But what happens is there, there are articles which we all saw, right? This 39-year-old Utah woman dies after getting the second dose of the vaccine. And that leads to vaccine hesitancy uh, because what's really available to you is not the 0. 0.000086 likelihood that you're going to get a blood clot. What's available to you is the vivid story of, of uh, the 39-year-old Utah woman. And even, even statisticians and decision scientists are prone to the availability heuristic in their daily life. And finally, I think the flip side of this is what I'm what might be called the non-availability heuristic. And I think I think most people's reaction to climate change, although it's changing, uh, is that that is, you know, there is no one event as dramatic and as dramatically connected to climate change as the event of somebody getting a blood clot after a vaccine. So sea levels may rise in Miami, uh, glaciers may melt, but in the absence of being able to, to, in your mind, attribute the, the events to climate change, it's the non-availability that makes people uh, pretty slow to deal with climate change issues. Let me stop there. Yeah, thank you. And so could you talk a bit more about what are the implications for these, you know, I guess these different uh, subjective factors in, in policymaking uh, both in influencing it and like how should policymaking proceed? So, I mean, the, it's easier to describe the problem than the solution, mm -hmm. but the problem is that, you know, if you, let's, let's say that we're talking about legislators, elected legislators, uh, they are, any effort they make to deal with, um, with risk is going to call, call for an investment that will only pay off at some later point. In fact, one of the problems with dealing with catastrophic risks is if you succeed, it won't happen. So, you know, what does success look like for a policymaker when something that people thought wasn't, wasn't going to happen at all doesn't happen? Uh, and how do you, how does a policymaker, how do we, those of us who think about these risks, how do we get policymakers to move beyond the availability heuristic and actually think about what the dangers are and get their constituents to move beyond the availability heuristic. I think those, yeah. are, those, are, those are not social science challenges so much as they are, are political challenges. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, uh, one of the questions uh, from our audience is that, yeah, uh, we have this, the importance of the ability to convince policymakers to imp implement these impactful policies. And so do you think that at this point, organizations that are working on X risks should devote more time to communicating preventive strategies? I think it's really important to learn how to communicate the risks and then to communicate, uh, get behind strategies that are likely to work and communicate them. Uh, absolutely. Yeah, and I think there are definitely organizations working on that. Um, I'm not sure if uh, up and glow is one of them, but uh, I'll move on to, we have a few more audience questions here. Um, yeah, so how do you explain the non-availability heuristic for those who experience climate disaster, but still deny climate change exists? Uh, for example, the Texas snowstorms and how many Texans reacted to this? You know, I think this applies in a lot of other areas as well. I mean, I think, I think that really fits two two of the, the points I made here. One is that there's no, no particular storm, however disastrous it is, can be linked to global warming in the way that a vaccine, at least in people's, in people's minds, is linked to a, uh, or the harm from a vaccine, a clot is linked mm. to a vaccine. You know, whether something's available or not, is a matter of subjective perception. So one 
one strategy for people who care, and let's just say focused on climate, is to try to make the link between uh, disastrous storms and climate change. And you know, maybe this is a case where the public is beginning to deal with it. But secondly, uh, you have the, the political problem or the, the ideological problem that climate change probably fits if you go back to Dan Gahan's framework in, in the category where, where people who are, I mean, let's just use conservative and, and liberal as, as you know, proxies for his more complicated analysis, a place where conservatives kind of say, bring it on, you know, we, that's just not something that's a big deal for us. So I, th I, think, I think of the various existential risks, the one that I think, you know, fits to go back to the earlier part, the one that fits the, the category of we, we actually know what it is and we know how to deal with it. I think psychologically, it may be the hardest one to uh, get people to focus on. Hmm. Uh, could you talk more about that? Like why you think that is? I mean, think about, think about uh, a nuclear explosion or even a meteorite hit, mm -hmm. which is certainly both of those, certainly a meteorite hit is a much lower probability than climate change, which we know is happening. Meteorite hit is a dramatic moment. Uh, and you know, you you could you can have movies in which the meteorites hit. People read about what happened to the dinosaur, but it's a moment and it's very vivid. Uh, there there I'm, there there have been a number of films to try to make climate change as vivid, but it doesn't have uh, li literally the impact of a meteorite hit. Right, of course. Um, and let's see. There are some other questions here. Um, yeah, one is what research is being done to identify the best strategies to improve people's perception of risk in the long run? You know, do you think maybe a critical thinking curriculum would help or, you know, how can we work on these, you know, biases, I guess, or heuristics that we have? I mean, I think that, I mean, here, here is the bad news first, <laughs> that, most, that most of the research on how to de-bias people suggests that it's very hard. Uh, mm -hmm. So I, the course I've been, I, I have taught in the past on uh, judgment and decision-making is of course, the, goal, the initial goal of the course, I mean, I guess it remains a goal, is that if people understand some of these biases, they are less likely to exhibit them. Uh, the, the research actually suggests that to know, to know about the bias isn't very helpful. And I mean, just, just think about that in, in any of our own lives. You know, we know that the likelihood of, of dying from COVID vaccine is very low, but when our neighbor uh, has died from it or the newspaper just you know, has that on the front page, it gets to us much more than, than pallid statistics do. So th there's a lot of work to overcome. And I, I agree with your suggestion that education in how to think about risks and how to think about perceptions of risk could be helpful, but uh, there's, no, there's no silver bullet there. Right. Yeah. Do you think that those kinds of curriculums or training could at least help us you know, I guess, create different tools or, you know, checklists, processes that would help us, you know, uh, mitigate uh, those heuristics. I do. And if nothing else, uh, they'll hope people become better decision makers in, in mm -hmm. the non-existential risk world. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, of course, it doesn't just apply here. Um, well, I want to make sure that we have enough time for the other session to join. So, um, unless you had anything uh, that you'd like to share quickly. No, I think I think that's it. It's it's you know, again on on the psychology of this, it's it's not a very happy story. And back to just the earlier point about ranking risks uh, and risk risk trade offs, the risks that are most likely to get dealt with are the ones that are most 
uh, psychologically available to people, not necessarily the ones where there's the greatest danger and the greatest possibility of doing something about it. Right. Well, yeah, thank you so much, Paul, for your two very informative and interesting presentations and for your time with us today. Thank you all for coming. And thank you, Paul. Thank you, Suzanne. Thank you.